Hello and welcome to those of you who've just joined us. I'm Laura Stebbing, co-CEO of Accelerate Hair. I'm delighted to introduce this next session. Both these women have taken exceptional leadership decisions to pivot and grow their health tech businesses over COVID-19. And I'm so pleased that we have been hearing from them directly. Simone Tate will be leading the discussion. She's the founder of Poppy Seed Health, a telehealth solution transforming the way we support pregnant and postpartum women with 24 seven on-demand access to doulas, midwives and nurses. Poppy is making maternal health care accessible, affordable and trustworthy for birthing people everywhere, no matter where you are in your journey or where you are in the world. Just a text away. She's passionate about providing women with powerful tech solutions to make decisions in their, um, to make decisions in their lives for their health, wealth and happiness. Over to you, Simone. Thanks so much, Laura. I am so excited to be here um, and joined by Julia. Hi, I'm thrilled to be here this morning as well, coming to everyone from Texas. Uh, and Julia is the founder and CEO of Everly Well. Um, we are so excited to hear Julia specifically about why we're all here actually, which is a really big deal for us. Uh, obviously with the pandemic with COVID-19 and Everly Well being one of the very first companies to be FDA approved for at-home tests for COVID-19. So I wanna jump into it with you because I've been looking forward to hearing these answers myself. Um, so really curious to know, how did you make the decision to pivot your business resources, right? Because we all have our business goals that we have set up for the year, but those business goals and resources to immediately respond to COVID-19. Um, thanks so much, Simone. I'm thrilled to be here chatting with you specifically with your business in such an important space in women's health. Um, and so aligned, I think, with whatever really well really started as, which was helping to serve women and their families um, with testing needs. And that has been our mission for five years. And to your point, we had very aggressive growth goals for 2020, fully aligned with um, realizing that continued mission of making lab testing accessible, affordable, and really simple and easy to use um, in the digital age. And it was an interesting moment for us as a business. Um, we were, were a small startup. Um, we are 50 people in Austin mm -hmm. and having to make this decision in the wake of what appears to be an insurmountable problem. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I use a little bit of the, um, kind of story of David and Goliath as just a, a way to, um, orient because I think startups look at some of these problems and think, why would we ever get involved? Um, why would we choose to respond? And part of, I think, what's also important as context for this story is we were not only moving to shelter in place as a business, but we didn't know at the time when the decision had to be made in late February, early March for Everly Well, what would happen with our core business? Mm -hmm. You would think, we logically assumed that home health care would likely really take off as people had needs. On the other hand, we have to plan for the long term. We have to plan for a steady ship with clear strategic goals and not creating whiplash for our whole team in a super uncertain environment as it is for everyone's mental health. And so it was a really big decision that ultimately um, I felt committed we had to do something. But that first step, while that was taken by me with the board's approval, Every step after that was really decided on and pushed by the team. Mm -hmm. And I think ultimately that is the only way that this has even started to succeed for Everly Well is the entire team said, we can't not respond to this mission. This is so core to who we are as a company is providing easy and affordable lab testing at home. Um, if we choose to ignore this and to just march along with our growing core business, we will have failed ourselves. Sure. Um, but, but again, that, that really, as a leader, you can only lead so much. It has to come from the team and they really have propped me up throughout this. And so I'm so glad that you brought up the team because 
we, no matter what's going on in the world, it's really having the team all on board and, and core to the mission, but also being able to, uh, to very quickly put resources where we need to put them. So tell me a little bit more about some of those things that you did with the team. How did it change the dynamic on a daily basis, having what, what I'll call a short sprint, right, to get to the COVID-19 testing? What did that look like shifting internally? Um, I think this is the most important leadership moment likely of my career, um, good and bad, right? I've learned so much through this process because it's not, it was not only a sprint, but it was a sprint into another sprint, into another sprint that's creating a marathon where nobody's pacing themselves. Right. Um, and so that is a really, really tough management lesson to try to motivate people through that and also be very empathetic that my, my surroundings, which is at home with my family, taking care of my child, sheltering in place, um, look similar or different than others, but everyone is dealing with these same um, difficult challenges as well in their personal lives. And so being able to respond to that and yet we have a, a mission and a job to do at Everly Well has been, I think, really challenging. So we started, and, and one of our core values, and, and I think you should always try to hearken back to your core values, is transparency. And so we were really upfront about what we were doing as a business to cut extraneous costs until we knew where this was going so that we did not have to do any layoffs. Mm -hmm. Then we were really upfront about when the business was growing and we were going to have to turn on a bunch of hires and how behind we were in doing that and that it was going to be really hard until we had that accomplished but what that showed the team is i heard them i understood what they were dealing with and we we were doing everything possible to support them instead of just saying oh it's going to be great we're going to work hard look at our huge goals and everybody get behind it i think sometimes hearing from leaders that you acknowledge the challenge ahead and that you're solving for it and supporting it um, makes people feel heard and understood that you actually do have their backs in a really 24 7 work environment um, and then you know i'd be remiss not to share that it was not clear that Everly Well was going to be successful in getting FDA authorization. And we had to pivot a few times with our product, first healthcare provider, once we couldn't launch it to consumers. And then we worked for two months on the regulatory work to get approval. And so my biggest fear as a leader was actually how the team was going to feel if we weren't able to get this done after all of that work. And I'm, I feel very fortunate that now we have been able to really accomplish our objective and now are, are just um, able to scale testing. But that also was a risk that I had to weigh personally and the impact that that would have on the team. And it, it's a heavy weight to bear um, when you have people so committed and working so hard and to know that you have to take the risk towards potential failure and know that that's okay because otherwise you can't accomplish what's on the other side of potential success. That's right. And you know, you you hit on something there that's so important, which is it sounds like we're talking about a really long time. This was within eight to 10 weeks, right? I mean, this was from March when the pandemic really started and COVID really started to spread across the world. And so this was quick action, getting the team on board and then actually executing on it. Um, Anyway, bravo to you and your entire team. That's amazing. Um, and I do want to talk about the, the overall business for Everly Well, because one of the things that's exciting for me is women's health and women's digital health and access to uh, telemedicine and telehealth solutions, um, but specifically with the other testing, with the other things that you have at Everly Well, I was really excited to, to learn that 50% of the at-home tests are for women. So can you, can you tell us a little bit more about why that was you know, important to you with, with the product? Yeah, absolutely. And then I would love to hear your perspective as well, given your business. But um, I started Everly Well knowing that I had gone through a problem that I knew almost every woman had experienced to some degree in their life. And that to me said there's a market for this because it's a problem that I can help solve, which is I went through an odyssey of doctors for a bunch of unknown kind of generalized symptoms. Each doctor ran a bunch of tests 
And in the American healthcare system, as you are very familiar with, some of those tests were covered, some were not. There were different reasons for why. And I ended up not only not getting access to the data from all those tests, but then receiving a series of bills um, that totaled actually over $2,000 out of pocket. So not only did I not get any answers, I then faced this continuous kind of reinforcement of just how broken everything was with these bills. And so that is really the foundation of why I started Everly Well was this knowledge that women make 80% of healthcare decisions, both for their family units, as well as obviously for for themselves. Um, And they really are the drivers of the healthcare economy and the consumer economy. And yet they on average face surprise bills that are $400 higher for the same service than men. And the outcomes for women in healthcare, and especially women of color, are so drastically unacceptable compared to what you see for men. And there's proven studies over and over again that women are ignored, women's symptoms aren't listened to, and they overall are considered uh, or are not taken as seriously in the healthcare system. And so for me, this product, you know, we, we tackled one specific vertical in healthcare, which is lab testing. But it's a $25 billion market annually. Everyone needs a lab test. And women are the ones that are not only getting the higher bills, not getting tested for what they need, but they're also having to coordinate this for their families. It's another burden that women take on as part of their work. And so for me, this was something that I really saw. I said, look, if I can just get women from 30 to 40 on board with this, like that's a big enough market. And now, of course, what we've seen over the last five years is this has wide and broad applicability for Americans. Um, And that's been great to see as well, because we can now serve all populations. Um, And that, I think, is why our product really resonates with so many people from so many different walks of life, geographies, um, socioeconomic status, et cetera. Yeah. And to add to that, actually, Julia, that the other thing for women is it takes longer to get diagnosed. So you're just spending longer in the healthcare system or going to doctors trying to get the right diagnosis so that you have a health plan and a care plan. And the longer you spend, the more money you're also spending. And I actually, this the concept of the surprise bill is a real one, um, especially as it relates to maternal health care, which is where Poppy Seed Health is really focused, right? And, and part of our mission is to decrease non-emergent emergency room visits by about 30% while you're pregnant, because there are certainly lots of things that doulas and midwives and nurses, or what we call patient extenders, can can help you with. So, you know, if you're having trouble sleeping, for example, instead of maybe running to the doctor or even trying to get those answers immediately, you can text us and we can give you whole body holistic, you know, solutions for you to do at home. So, um, yeah, this is why we just love your at home product so much because it makes so much sense uh, to have that experience in the privacy of your own home, especially as a woman. And I realized with um, a global audience, some of this may sound surprising, um, given that I think uh, healthcare is delivered quite differently, especially maternal health in other countries, but it's it's such an important point um, that when women ha- or, or anyone really has to go in for an emergency visit or a last minute health care experience, we know 40% of people avoid treatment and care because right. of unknown cost. Um, right. And they don't know how much it will cost. And so you can imagine how much we can actually improve the system using these at-home solutions whether it's technology um, like telemedicine and texting um, and access to care or actual delivery of services like testing. Mm -hmm. How do you think about telehealth and telemedicine as it relates to the real evolution and innovation around um, what we like to call self-health tools and at-home testing? Where do you think it fits in? It's a great question. And I think I am, I feel like telemedicine is having its moment. And if we want to talk about potential silver linings from the pandemic, um, because uh, ideally we don't waste this incredibly tragic crisis, but yet have some good come from it. I think some of the loosening of regulations around telehealth have been um, just dramatically improving service for so many people. Um, I believe that much of routine and chronic condition management will remain in the home. And that means for telemedicine consults, for texting, for some for mental health, 
Mm -hmm. Um, All of these barriers to care that we don't think about and don't quantify, like transportation for in-person visits, time off of work during a work day, child care. Um, all of these really kind of behind the curtains act barriers yeah. for creating an equitable healthcare system. I believe home healthcare in so many ways using technology can solve this. And so I think it is a moment where um, we have to be sure that all of the providers of these services really ensure that this takes hold after the pandemic or in the wake of the 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 crisis, that way we can actually change healthcare permanently in a way that I think will actually result in a better system. That's right. And, and, you know, the adaptability to telehealth and telemedicine because of COVID, I don't think there's any going back. We're obviously biased. We're a telehealth solution, but the number one thing that we see and that we've built into the fabric of Poppy Seed Health, which mm-hmm. you have as well with Everly Well, is accessibility, right? So exactly those points around accessibility, whether it's you know transportation or having to lose wages, but especially for the folks um, in the U.S. and Thank you for pointing out we do have a global audience today, um, but but in the U.S. specifically. Um, as it comes to racial disparities and systematic disparities within healthcare and beyond, um, but specifically as it relates to the work that we're both doing with our companies, I think it's really, really important that accessibility stays at the forefront of what we do. Um, It's such a joint shared mission. And I think um, when you have been a person who's experienced that in the healthcare system, it makes you that much more passionate about solving it. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, So I know that we have some questions that are going to be coming in from the audience soon, but one of the things that uh, has come up as we were preparing for this is what advice do we have for founders um, that are you know, currently in the position to be making some of these business decisions very quickly and pivoting their business resources. Um, So I'm going to throw that to you first. Uh, What advice do you have for founders? And I guess I'll also preface this and say that although Poppy Seed is a a strong but mighty team and we're rapidly growing, we're not as large as Everly Well yet, but we're going to get there. And there's still dynamic impact that can happen on both ends. So I'm going to throw the question to you first from your perspective. Absolutely. And then um, I miss the earlier days of building a startup. (laughs) So I'll I'll pitch it back to you after that. So um, for just some context, Everly Well now has about 100 employees. Um, We're based in Austin, Texas. We are uh, national in the U.S. And we have over 30 different at-home tests Um, And during the course of the pandemic, we are expected to triple our revenue this year as a result of the adoption of at-home health products. So our core business has really accelerated. Um, So when I talk about, uh, and then just from a a venture context setting, we have raised over $50 million from venture capital investors over the course of the last several years. Um, And, you know, while I have not been through, um, really, I have been fundraising in, in a a very favorable venture capital market, although certainly not for first time non-healthcare, solo, non-technical female founder. Um, however, I still have the benefit of raising during a good market. And I think that as founders, this is a really important moment to actually view this as a moment to cut, throw away all of the non, not core priorities and really, really focus your business um, because great companies will find a way through and will succeed. Um, That does not mean it won't be difficult and it does not mean it won't require tough decision-making and trade-offs. But if if you're in an industry that's taking a hit right now, focusing, cutting back and focusing on making it through is going to be a, a winning strategy. If you are in an industry that has the benefit of almost the opposite problem of too much demand and needing to scale to meet that, Um, motivating your team, raising capital, being able to really focus on the the sustainable types of demand and customers, I think is the other side of that equation. Um, I had a really interesting moment in early March where I had to be optimizing for both of these things. We cut $3 million in operating expenses as we all went home from our office and I worked hard to protect all of our jobs, not knowing how Everly Well was going to fare. At the same time, 
we had incredible demand for healthcare provider COVID testing. And so weighing that at the same time and then communicating that to the org, you just have to be really empathetic and upfront about your values and what the business is going through. Um, so that would be my best advice. The best thing that founders do is adapt. It's our number one quality. And so lean into that as much as you possibly can um, as a startup founder and find a way through. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now back, what are you seeing kind of at, at early stage, Simone? I mean, I know your business has actually had some of the, the upside side of this, right? right. Um, but right. how are you going through that? Yeah, no. So we came into March and, and really coming in like everyone else, not exactly knowing what was going on with COVID-19, but we knew one thing because we were hearing it all over. And that is the maternal health care space, specifically where are mamas mm. having their babies? Is it safe for them to have their babies? Um, I'm based in New York City. And uh, mm. there was a time where partners were not allowed in the hospital. And because they weren't allowed in the hospital in labor and delivery, mamas were actually birthing by themselves with the fantastic frontliners. Thank you very much. But that journey is so much about the emotional and mental health support that you need to get through that part of your journey. And so we saw a 140% spike within eight weeks, almost immediately of just mamas reaching out to us, coming to us, using our services for that emotional and mental health support that they needed to get through wherever they were in their in their pregnancy journey and then also postpartum journey. So we actually saw the upside of it. But again, as a small team, one of the big things that we had to do was decide where the priorities were going to be with our budget. Um, so I had actually just decided to go out to fundraise for our first round and I put a stop to it. We went heads down. We immediately also started to, to support our supply side, which mm -hmm. was also not able to be in the hospitals, especially doulas. And so we ramped up on the supply side to support the growth on our demand side with mm -hmm. the mamas. What actually came out of that after you know I picked up my head eight weeks later was it's time to raise. And some people would say it's really shocking to try and go out and raise during COVID. And yes, we didn't know what the venture landscape looks like. I, we are a lot of alike. I am also a solo founder. I am also a, a black woman, statistically yeah. speaking, that only gets about 0.2% of, of, of capital or 2%, sorry, of, of venture capital dollar. <laughs> I think, Simone, it's 0.2. It is 0.2. It is, yeah, it, is that, it is that, and it's an important point. Yeah, of, yeah. of venture capital dollars. And so for me, I you know sat with my team and said, you know, this is the time where we need to not only reach our milestones, but even more importantly, because of the growth that we're seeing, which, by the way, is never going to go backward, right? And so... Um, so I am actually out there raising and, and it's been a really interesting uh, time to raise because we are in telehealth and because we are very much transforming what the future looks like with the tech enabled product in maternity in maternal health care, which which hasn't been touched a whole lot. So um, my advice to founders is that it's so important to think about your one and three and five year plans. Yes, it is. But in these early days, it's even more important to be, as you said, flexible. And I think really listening to the needs of your team, because that will help to shape and, and your, your customers, of course, but that will help to shape the next steps. And you can take a really strong and confident stance in making sure that your, your company's resources are going to the, to the right places. Um, okay, so we do have some audience questions. I'm going to get to those. Great. Julia, actually this, okay, so uh, this is for both of us. Both Everlywell and Poppy Seed Health are mission-driven enterprises. How would you advise other purpose-led businesses starting out and so-called prepare to fail mentality to keep momentum up when their missions falter. Oh, it's a such an important grounding question. Um, I think every company and every startup, the founder is deeply passionate about the problem that they're solving. And it may not be something that excites everyone, but the founder brings that energy and brings that orientation around the mission. Some businesses have an easier time transferring that mission to their employees. For example, for, for you and me, we have customers telling us every day that we change their life. 
it's really easy to then inspire and seed that with the rest of the team. Um, but as the as missions start to either falter internally from a cultural standpoint, or as they're challenged externally, um, it can be really, really hard at it when you're trying to take your founder energy and have that come through everyone else on your team. And so I really believe that you have to talk about your mission and your values as much as possible, make decisions tied to your mission and communicate those. As an example, we just cut prices on half of our tests to be less than $49 cash pay. Um, that is because we are mission driven to make testing affordable. That impacts our top line, but ultimately allows us to have broader reach and ubiquity, which makes us a bigger brand, right? That, but that was an entirely mission driven decision based on access. And we talk about that a lot. Right. And we have to take questions from the team. And I think being able to tie clear business decisions to mission, even when it's hard, is important. And it doesn't mean that your mission can't shift and change. But the purpose of a mission is to inspire and also to help you make hard calls. Um, and so if you can really articulate both sides of that, it becomes much easier than to be, quote, mission driven because you just are living it. That's right. That's right. So um, at Poppy Seed Health, we actually, it's needled into the fabric of what we do. We are a B Corp certified company, which means that we put both profit and purpose on the same level playing field of priorities. And very early on, I knew just from my personal experience and needing a 24 seven support line, really, um, that I wanted to make that as accessible to everyone as possible. And so we decided to have a give back initiative that's already built into our business model. We take a dollar amount from every member every month, and we funnel that through something called Poppy Promise. And we donate those dollars back to the organizations, the companies, uh, and the individuals like doulas and doula collectives and midwives that are doing the work to solve the maternity healthcare crisis in the US anyway, which affects black and brown mamas more than about four times to five times uh, more um, in maternity and maternal uh, morbidity rates. So that's important in the fabric of the business. Um, okay, so let me ask this last question and then we are gonna throw it back over to Laura. So um, this is a good one to, to end on, which is during an unprecedented time of organizational change and societal unrest, where the news headlines move quicker than you can keep up with, I wonder where do you see innovation in Everlywell and Poppy Seed Health going in the next six months? I can answer that really quickly for Poppy Seed Health. Uh, we are launching an app. We're launching an, a new app that's coming to market uh, and that's coming to market in the next quarter. So our innovation specifically will be bringing us closer into the healthcare and hospital systems and for each mama that needs support. That's, that's what we're doing in the next six months. How about you? Yeah. You know, I think for Everly Well, we have innovation on so many fronts. We've had to be very specific about it. So obviously part of what has really accelerated is our partnerships with COVID um, testing that actually then move into working with very large companies to provide all kinds of testing paid for by employers and insurance companies. Um, and that I think is a really important point again around access. Employers in the US pay so much of the healthcare burden in the country. This is a great way for them to offer this as a benefit as well. Um, and then, you know, we actually saw something really interesting. We've seen about a 200% increase in our sexually transmitted infection testing business. Um, so we've actually launched a new model where for $14 a month, you can have unlimited access to at least one STI test a month and then significantly discounted um, testing beyond that. And again, all in service to helping people get access to the, to the tests that they need and help them do that safely and securely in their own home. But these are just little innovations that we see based on changing consumer behavior in the pandemic. And um, I do think it will be incredibly important in this next six months, especially in the U.S., to also be developing specific causes that can help address um, racial inequities, especially in healthcare for us, um, yeah. gender inequities, and really thinking strategically about what products do we have that already help close those gaps and how can we transform them from a business model standpoint. Yeah. 
Julia, I could talk to you for hours. And I think we will. We'll figure that out offline. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. I so appreciate it. Uh, and it was so great talking to you. Thank you. This has been just a joy. And I'm thrilled to be able to join everyone here this morning um, and in the U.S. to start my day with something so inspiring. So. Yeah. Thank you so much, Julia and Simone. I'm I'm just so incredibly inspired by your brave and bold leadership. And we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today, given all the millions of things you have on. And thanks everyone for joining um, in live. Please stick around for the next session with drum roll, Hillary Rodham Clinton, Cherie Blair, CVE QC, and Dame Vivian Hunt. We're extremely excited about that too.